All right, let me invite you to grab your Bibles and join me in the book of Acts. We have made it to chapter 6, and we are looking at Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And as we uh, turn there together, let's pause and pray. Father, we are grateful for your word. We confess that your word is truth. Your word sanctifies us. Your word equips us. Your word challenges us, Lord. Your word corrects us and rebukes us and trains us and, and makes us competent to serve you. But Lord, your, your word reveals your son. And it reveals the truth of the Gospel. And we pray, Father, that in this time, as Your Word is proclaimed, that Your Holy Spirit ultimately would be doing the proclaiming. And that Your Holy Spirit would not only speak through me, Lord, I ask that Your Spirit would help the hearers to hear Your truth. And Lord, we pray that You would apply it to our hearts and lives and change us accordingly for Your glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Reading from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. This is what Luke writes. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy or full of the Spirit, and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. For those who have ears to hear, let them hear the truth of God's word. Fitting, uh, on a Sunday morning, I want to talk about distractions. Um, we can all identify with being distracted from time to time. And uh, certainly there are some who, struggle, who struggle with distractions more than others. Uh, we know that, but it's, there's some things that you're doing, some jobs or tasks that you're actively participating in where it's really a bad thing to be distracted, right? Driving a car or operating heavy machinery, Maybe you're performing surgery, something like that. You, you, you don't want to be distracted in those times. So as a pastor, uh, it's never ideal for me to get distracted when I'm preaching. Okay? Uh, thankfully, it hasn't happened too often, but there have been a couple of times when I got very distracted while I was preaching. Uh, one time I'm, I'm not going to share with you. Uh, you could ask me about it later. Um, out of after church. Um, another time, there was a young boy, this was at my last church, there was a young boy who was maybe six or seven years old, and as I was preaching, I noticed that he was doing this, making all kinds of arm movements. He had a very concentrated look on his face. He was like, I'm preaching, right? And so I'm thinking, what in the world is this guy doing? What is this little boy doing? What, what is he doing? And it's amazing that when, when, you're, when I'm preaching, so I can have like these secondary and sometimes even tertiary thoughts while I'm still talking, which is weird. Anyhow, I, I, I just continued on, and I'm seeing him. He still has that look on his face, and he's doing that. And then it hit me. He was trying very earnestly to mimic my arm movement. And my hand gestures while I was preaching. And then I, I became very self-conscious. I started thinking, is that what I look like when I'm preaching? 
it looks like I'm trying to land a plane. Right? And so thankfully, you know, I just, I plowed forward. I, I, I just put the distraction out of my mind, and, and I just, you know, I wouldn't look at him the rest of the day. But, but I just knew he was there doing it. So t- sometimes distractions can be harmless. Other times they can be a serious problem. And uh, distraction in the church, not just during a sermon, but distraction in the church when the body is being tempted to be distracted from its mission. That's serious. And that's a problem. And so I'm, re- I'm really thankful for commentators like, like John Stott, for example. He's a great... Uh, commentator, he, he points out that in, in chapters 4 through 6 in the book of Acts, we see Satan attacking the church. And he says the first way that Satan is attacking the church was through persecution. And so we've been seeing that, right? The apostles are getting arrested. They're standing on, on trial before the Sanhedrin. They're getting beaten. We saw that last week, right? So persecution is one attack of Satan. Then he points out another attack from Satan is corruption within the church. And we saw that with Ananias and Sapphira, right? The internal corruption is, is an attack from the enemy. Peter says Satan had filled Ananias' heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Right? But there's a third attack here that we might not recognize as an attack. And that's what we see in chapter 6 is that the devil can attack the church through distraction. He could attack the church through distraction. Stott says this, the devil's next attack was the cleverest of the three. Having failed to overcome the church by either persecution or corruption, he now tried, to, he now tried distraction. If he could preoccupy the apostles with social administration, which though essential, was not their calling, they would neglect their God-given responsibilities to pray and to preach, and so leave the church without any defense against false doctrine. Those first two schemes of the devil, they grab our attention pretty quickly. Persecution, right? Or even internal corruption. Like that. We see that, right? But this is subtle, isn't it? This is, this is subtle. This is if we're not paying attention, if we're not careful, we can just drift from what we ought to be doing. We just drift from our mission and be doing something else. And so our text reveals that the church must guard against being distracted from her mission We're going to study two responses to distraction in the church and their results. Two responses to distraction in the church and their results. The first response to distraction in the church is priority of calling. Priority of calling. We just saw how the apostles, they were arrested again. They were beaten, right? They got set free. They were charged, don't preach the gospel anymore. Don't talk about Jesus anymore. And they left receiving their beatings. And what were they doing? rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus they were rejoicing and they continued to preach and teach about Jesus and so the persecution only caused the church to do what here here's the leaders getting arrested what's going to happen the church grows you see that verse one now in these days that's the location in these days after that persecution when the disciples were increasing in number a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the church is growing. Disciples are increasing. More and more people are trusting in Jesus. That's great, right? We would all celebrate that. But it proved to bring with it some logistical issues, right? Some growing pains. We have a complaint by the Hellenists against the Hebrews. So the Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews. So these are Jews, but they spoke Greek. The Hebrews are Jews that spoke Aramaic. Okay? And the complaint by the Hellenists is that their widows, the Hellenist Greek-speaking Jews that were widows, were being neglected during the daily distribution. So it would seem that the church was carrying on the mantle of providing for the poor and caring for widows as God has always called His people to do. If you look throughout God's Word, Old Testament, New Testament, God calls on His people to care for the most vulnerable in society. He calls on His people, especially He singles out two groups, orphans and widows, who had no means of support, no means to provide for themselves, that the, God, the people of God are called to care for them and provide for them. And so eight widows in the ancient world, 
they had very few options. If family did not take care of them, they're, they're stuck. And so it was also common for Greek-speaking Jews or Hellenists who lived outside of Israel in the, disper- in the dispersion, at, when it was time to retire from work, a lot of them would move back to Israel. So you had a lot of Hellenists living, Greek-speaking Jews living in Israel, so much so that they had Greek-speaking synagogues that were dedicated for all of the Greek-speaking Jews that were now living in Jerusalem. So we had this issue because what Jesus does is He takes people who are wildly different, from different cultures, different backgrounds, and what does He do? He brings them all together, right? And so we need to realize that Greek was the lingua franca of the day. It was the common language. And so most of the Jews living in Israel, even in Galilee, we see that with the disciples, most of the Jews knew Greek. But here's the problem. Not all who just spoke Greek knew Aramaic. Right? And so we have an issue, a language barrier. And it seems that when the church was setting up, distributing money or, or food for the widows, it is these women, specifically the Greek-speaking widows, who are being neglected. Now we need to ask the question, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Some say, well, this is just simply an unintentional overlooking. Right? It was just unintentional, it just happened. Others go to the far other extreme and say, well, this is just indicative of a much larger schism between Hebrew-speaking Jews and Greek-speaking Jews, and it actually shows that they had different theology and different doctrine and different understandings of the Old Testament law and different understandings of the temple. Well, which is it? I'm not sure it's either. Okay, It's hard to say that this is just unintentional. It's hard to say that they're just being overlooking these widows. Why do I say that? Well, how unintentional is it when it's a specific group of people? who are being overlooked. And the specific group of people who are being overlooked are being distinguished by what language they spoke. That's hard to believe that's unintentional. right? At the same time, there's no evidence in the Scriptures or even from church history that, that at this time there was a large schism between the Jews who spoke Hebrew and the Jews who spoke Greek about doctrine. Okay, We just don't see that. So what we have here, it seems, is a form of cultural discrimination happening in the church. And and that's not to say this is malicious. This is not to say, oh, the apostles don't like the Greek-speaking Jews. That's not what this is. It's not even overt. You know what this is? This is a blind spot. This is a blind spot. These widows slipped through the cracks probably because they were different and they weren't a priority. And the Hellenists that not only spoke Greek, and here's what we need to understand, they not only spoke Greek, but they thought like Greeks, and they behaved like Greeks. Culturally speaking, they were Greeks, even though they were Jewish. We also need to understand the Hebrews, not just, they didn't just speak Aramaic, but they were deeply immersed in Hebrew culture. And so this was a problem. Thankfully, we don't have this problem anymore today sarcasm intended right okay yes it's a problem that started way in the beginning right we see it and it continues to be a problem culture clashes have always been present amongst God's people and it's a problem because God has determined to say I don't want you to stay in your little singular groups I'm redeeming a whole host of people from every nation tribe and tongue right that's who God is and then I'm going to throw them all together and not only that you're going to live forever with them You better start enjoying them now. And so this has always been a problem. It always is a problem when we look at other people, other brothers and sisters in Christ, and we look at them differently because they're not like us. Because they're different than us. And we don't have to be overt. We don't have to be malicious. We could just be apathetic, like what was happening to these widows. Whether it's they speak a different language, or maybe they have a different culture than we have. This is a worldly mindset. It's not the mind of Christ. We need to understand that. So if you read Ephesians chapter 2, you're going to see that Jesus died to tear down the dividing wall between Jews and Greeks. Right? Between 
uh, all distinctions of race and culture and ethnic differences. Those differences remain, but the barrier between fellowship has been torn down by Jesus. So listen to what Paul writes. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. He says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that He might create in Himself one new man in the place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. That's a lot of verses. Did you follow that? Did you follow what Paul's saying here? He's saying, when Jesus died on the cross, what He did, all those barriers that separate people, whether it's language or culture or whatever, Jesus tore those down. Right? He made us one people through His own death, through His sacrifice. He broke down every dividing barrier. He reconciles all of us to God in His body. And Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for our sins is greater than all of our differences. And we need to do our best to love everyone and not allow our differences to divide us. And I want you to notice something here. Notice the solution of the apostles is not saying, you know, why, the Hellenist widows just need to learn our language and start thinking like us. Is that what they say? They need to learn the language and start thinking the way that we think. Is that, is that what they do? No. Because to be a Christian is not to conform to a specific language. It's not to conform to a specific culture. It's to have yourself conform to Christ who transcends that all. And so we need to see this, that Christ has come to redeem a people that transcends all of those differences. And what is the end result? You want a sneak preview? Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. This is what John sees in heaven. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's where we're going. right? And, and so we have this complaint, a legitimate complaint about these widows who are being neglected, and the response of the apostles is very crucial. They could ignore the problem. Hopefully it will go away. right? They, but they don't do that. They don't get defensive either, saying, you know, we think we're doing a pretty good job. This is hard, right? They're they're not doing that either. It seems like they honestly evaluate the issue, sees that there is an issue, right? And they're careful about the solution. What's the solution? Look at verse 2. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the Word of God to serve table. So the apostles' answer to the issue is to call a family meeting. Church meeting, right? And so they summon the full number of the, the disciples at this point. Which, had, How many are, are, are in the church at, around this time? We're talking about thousands, right? Thousands. So the, probably this is at the temple. And you know the Jewish leaders love that, right? So anyway, the, the temple is the only place big enough to kind of accommodate a meeting of that size. And here we see one of the things the apostles fought for was that they not abandon their calling to preach the Word of God in order to serve the tables. Okay? So we need to be careful how we understand this. Are the apostles saying, you know what, serving tables is beneath us? Serving tables is beneath our dignity. That's JV church work for varsity. Is that what what they're saying here? Is that their attitude? No, it's, it's not. Again, Stott is helpful. John Stott says, there is no hint whatever that the apostles regarded social work as inferior 
to pastoral work or beneath their dignity, it is entirely a question of calling. And so Jesus had charged and commissioned the apostles to preach the gospel and to preach the word of God. And they were gifted to go and preach the gospel and preach the word of God. That's how they were called to serve the church. And they knew it was a bad idea for them to get distracted from that calling. They knew that. And so when we're not able to give adequate attention or energy or focus to our task, we begin to hit to all fields, right? We start to make ourselves, spread ourselves too thin. And then what happens? Everything begins to suffer. And so they're right here to prioritize their calling. But I want you to see their solution. It's not, we need to focus on prayer. We need to focus on preaching the words. So let the widows just suck it up and deal with it. Is that the solution? No, it's not. They knew this is an important matter. This is a crucial thing that they must address. And so look at verse 3. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit, and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. And so their proposed solution that they put before the church is for the church to identify seven men who could, deleg- who could take on this responsibility of distributing the food. And what qualifications are they looking for? First, good reputation. Secondly, full of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, full of wisdom. That's what they're looking for. Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. So that means no scandals attached to them. Good reps, right? They should be full of the Spirit. And here's another reminder to you all. All Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but not all Christians are filled by the Holy Spirit. You know the difference? All Christians are sealed and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't mean we're living our lives filled by the Holy Spirit. To be filled by the Spirit is to fully yield yourself to the Spirit and His influence. But also notice they were to be filled with wisdom. They had to be able to make wise and good decisions. And it's really noteworthy that the apostles give spiritual qualifications for a very practical job. You see that? The apostles did not say, you know what, guys, this is really a logistical thing, so find somebody who's good at administration and make them do it. No, the apostles are saying, we want spiritually vibrant men to handle this. We want guys that are filled with the Spirit, who have good reputations, who are living for the Lord, and who are wise. Now, there are some who believe that this text is the establishment of the diaconate, or the office of deacons. Okay, Now, that might be the case. It very well might be the case, but just a couple notes about that. Uh, The seven are never called deacons here. The Greek word is diakonoi. They're they're not called that. The word to serve in verse 3, where the apostles talk about serving tables, is the Greek word diakoneo, okay? Which means to serve or to minister, to take care of. But we have to also point out the same word is used for the work of the apostles in verse 4. Look at verse 4. They say, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. The word ministry there is diakoneo. It's the service of the Word. I don't think that's an accident. I I think this is a deliberate word choice by Luke. Both the work of the twelve and the work of the seven are called diakonia. And so diakonia is a generic word for service or ministry. And you could add all kinds of adjectives to it. Right? Pastoral service, uh, hospitality service, uh, administrative service. You could add all kinds of it, but it's service, it's ministry before the Lord. Neither ministry is inherently superior or inferior to the others. They're both ministries, right? Both are seeking to glorify God. Both are seeking to bless their brothers and sisters. Both require spirit-filled people to carry them out. What's the difference? The difference is that they require different gifts and different calling to carry them out. So go ahead and read what Paul writes about the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. Luke's done a good job in Sunday school 
uh, teaching about this, but Paul likens the church to a body, to a human body. And he says we all have different gifts. We're like different body parts. And this is what Paul writes. He says, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each, of, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And so, what's Paul saying here? He's saying it's God who arranges the church the way he wants to, right? He is the one who gives gifts according to his own desire, his own will. He gives gifts as he desires. And if we were all gifted in the same way, and if we had all the same calling, we would be completely useless. It's like a body that was just one giant eye. How much can an eye get done? You tell me. What can an eye by itself do? Disconnected from the rest of the body. Not much. You can't do anything. It's useless. And no one part of the body can look down at another part of the body and say, you know what? I don't need you. I'm better than you. I'm varsity, you're JV, right? It can't do that. And so we have to be careful here because some people in the body are gifted in a certain way and they begin to look down on others in the body who aren't gifted like they are and they start to expect, why aren't you doing what I'm doing? And you begin to look down on your brothers and sisters failing to recognize, well, God wires us differently and gives us all different gifts to use for His service. And so He calls us in different ways. Every Christian has a gift from the Spirit to build up the church. Every Christian, I would argue, has a calling to ministry. Now, the question is, not if you are equipped for that calling, because God, God says every, every to each has been given a manifestation from the Spirit of, of a gift for the building up of the church. The question isn't, are you gifted? The question is, how are you gifted and what is your calling? And how are you using your individual gift to build up the body of Christ, the church? So take note of the priority of calling that the apostles respond with. You need to recognize that the body of Christ is made up of many different people, many different gifts. And it's not wrong to protect your time to carry out the task that God has given you to carry out. That's what the apostles are doing here. Sometimes you have to say no to one thing so that you can give your attention to the area that God is calling you to. And so my question this morning is, how is God calling you to serve the church? How has He gifted you? What is the calling He's placed upon your life? It's something. It's something. You are not so exceptional that you are ungifted. <laughs> and so this takes us to the second response to the threat of distraction in the church, and that's unity of action. Unity of action. How does the church respond to the apostles' proposition here, to their proposal? The answer is they like it. Look at verse 5. What they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, and, and a proselyte of Antioch. So, church agrees with the apostles. They pick out seven guys. Now, their choices are very, very interesting. What do you know about these seven guys that they picked? Chances are you're like, I know Stephen pretty well, right? Because Luke is about to devote a lot of ink to Stephen. We're going to study in the next few weeks, okay? And, and so we know a, a decent amount about Stephen. We also know a little bit about Philip. This is Philip. He's known as Philip the Evangelist. This is not the same Philip who was one of the twelve, because there was a Philip of the twelve disciples. This is a different Philip. Luke's going to write about him in chapter 8. What do you know about these other guys? Oh, somebody, somebody said already, yeah. N the New Testament itself does not tell us anything more about these five other guys. W we see Luke saying Nicholas was a proselyte from Antioch. We, a proselyte means he was a Gentile who converted to Judaism before he got saved. So he's a Gentile who became Jewish by conviction and then came to Christ that implies the others were all born as Jews. But as was mentioned, the thing that really stands out about these seven guys is that they all have Greek names. Uh, every single one of them, all seven of these men have Greek names. So is this just a coincidence? 
What do you think? Is this a coincidence? I don't think so. Now you might say, well, it's possible for some Jews to have Greek names. That, that's true. It's possible. But in Rome, from this time period, the names that were found inscribed of the Jews, one, only one-third of those names, of all those names they found transcribed, only one-third had Greek names. And that was in Rome. So it stands to reason that in, in, in Israel, that's even going to be less. Okay, It is not a coincidence that all seven have Greek names. Commentator Craig Keener writes this, The seven are not only Hellenists, they are conspicuously Hellenists. The community selected and the apostles blessed members of the offended minority group. As members of the minority, the new leaders could better understand the issues that caused the offense as well as bring assurance that the minority's voice was heard and trusted. Now, this is really, really interesting because the Hebrew Christians, they could have tried to do a power play and say, no, 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 we need a split here. Let's have uh, four Hebrew-speaking Jews and three Greek-speaking Jews on the, on the seven, right? They, they could have tried to do something like that just to hold a majority, but they don't do that. Instead, seemingly, all seven are Hellenists. All seven are Greek-speaking. But also, Luke reminds us in describing the seven, these are qualified men. So this isn't just, hey, let's pick some guys from the Greeks. Come on. This is, let's find qualified guys from the Greeks. That's what they did. They were filled with the Spirit. They had good reputations. They were filled with wisdom. And what is the, uh, the response to the apostles to the church's selection? Look at verse 6. These they set before the apostles, they prayed and laid their hands on them. So they brought these guys before the the leaders, before the apostles, and the apostles are praying for them and they're laying hands on them. We still do this today. We still lay hands on people, right? We just did it recently. What's the deal with that? Why do we do that? You ever wonder, why are they putting their hands on people? Right? What, What is the purpose of that? We do that for pastors. We do that for missionaries. We do that for people who are being commissioned to go serve the Lord. Why are we doing this? Is it magical? Are we conveying something through touching them? No. Okay, that's not the idea here. Here, this is a sign of affirmation from the apostles, from the ones that Jesus appointed to lead the church. Here's an affirmation that they're agreeing that these seven are worthy to go and serve in this special role of administration. And also, it's a way that we commission people. And they're being commissioned for ministry. It's a setting apart for the purpose of ministry. And what's, I think, really key for us to see here is that the church is united in this action. They are united beneath the leadership of the apostles. They are united in the choice of the seven. And the apostles then are united with the the church in affirming the choice of these seven men. And that's important to see because this whole disturbance really could have wrecked havoc with the church unity. Right? This whole thing could have been a big problem for the body of Christ. These Greek widows were being neglected, which was causing hurt feelings. The apostles set the tone in recognizing this is a problem. We need a remedy for. We don't have the time to do this, right? We can't adequately carry out this task. So they delegate. And they delegate authority so others can take care of this oversight and remedy it. And so we see the church is able to stay united for what purpose? For the purpose of making disciples of Jesus and bringing glory to God. Puritan author Richard Sibbs, in a great book he wrote called The Bruised Reed, He says this, he says, it would be a good contest amongst Christians, one to labor to give no offense, and the other to labor to take none. Let me say that again. It would be a good contest amongst Christians, one to labor to give no offense, and the other to labor to take none. Labor to give no offense, right? Work to not offend your brothers and sisters, and work not to be offended. Or we can listen to God's Word, His inspired Word, which says this in Philippians 2, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so for the church to be united, there's got to be a lot of dying to self. 
a lot of dying to my own preferences, dying to my own, pri- my, own, my own wants and desires for the church to be united, to make disciples of Jesus and bring glory to God. There's some things that we need to swallow our pride and seek the benefit and the good of the whole. And that's what the believers are doing here. They're united in their action. This takes us to the third point here for this morning, and that is, let's look at the results. What are the results? Look at verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So first thing to notice, this is another summary statement by Luke about the general temperature condition of the church. Luke uses grammar, grammar nerds, anybody care about grammar here? You should, okay? Greek, Luke uses three imperfect tenses here to describe ongoing activities. So the word of God kept increasing. The number of disciples kept multiplying. And a great many priests kept coming to the faith. It's ongoing action that Luke is describing here. And don't miss the language. Because say hey, often, what do we say? church is growing right we say the church is growing what is luke saying hey one of his favorite sayings is not the church is growing he's saying the word of god spread there a difference between those two things sometimes there is right he doesn't say the church is growing he's saying the word of god spread and this growth this spreading is the direct result of the apostles saying what we need to focus on the ministry of the word We need to focus on the ministry of the Word. John Stott says this, the Word cannot spread when the ministry of the Word is neglected. Conversely, when pastors devote themselves to the Word, it spreads. And Luke equates the spreading of the Word with the multiplication of disciples. Why? He says, the Word continued to spread and more and more disciples came about. What's the correlation? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ, right? Through the proclamation, but through the sharing of the Gospel. The Word cannot spread if it's neglected. Now, social programs can spread without the Word, right? We can spread, and they're good. But you don't need the Gospel to spread a social program. You need the Gospel, you need the Word of God to spread discipleship for people to be saved. For men and women to be awoken up from their death and their sins to know that Jesus died for them. The only way that's going to happen is if the word is spread. As if the gospel is continued to be proclaimed. That Jesus Christ died for sinners, He conquered the grave, and He offers eternal life to all who believe. And so the word of God must be proclaimed, it must be preached in order for it to spread. And Luke includes a key little note here. At the end, he says, and many of the priests were getting saved. Many of the priests were getting saved. Why is that important? Well, so far in the book of Acts, most of the opposition the church has received has come from where? From the priests, right? From the priests. Now, certainly, you need to know, the priests that were on the Sanhedrin did not make up all of the priests in Israel. It's estimated that at this time there were 18 to 20,000 priests and Levites. Okay? They only served for a short amount of time. But 18 to 20,000 priests and Levites. And what's happening here? The gospel is breaking in their ranks. The gospel is breaking through the hardest hearts. People could have looked at priests and said, uh oh, he's a priest. Don't even bother. He's not going to believe. He's a lost cause. Don't you know how they feel about the church? Don't you know how they feel about Jesus? They hate Jesus. Don't even bother. That's not, that's not the approach to ever take, right? To think it like that is to minimize the power of the gospel. I mean, if it was up to us, sure, we couldn't make people believe. We could never make a priest believe. It would never happen. But if God uses the foolishness of what we preach to save His chosen then he'll break through the hardest heart. He will do whatever work is necessary. All we have to do is share it. All we have to do is be faithful to share the good news with everybody. So here we see the church dealing with distraction. We see the church dealing with inner turmoil. People are upset. uh, the, The widows are being neglected. 
What was their response? They prioritized their calling. They delegate authority. They act as a united body to deal with the issue. And the result is the Word of God spreads. Right? The Word of God spread. People are trusting in Jesus. So I want to leave you here this morning with a couple questions that uh, ideally will be rattling in your head the rest of the day. Maybe, maybe the week. Okay? The first one is, what would it look like if we all were fulfilling the ministry and God, calling God has given to us? What would the church look like if we were all carrying out our own giftedness and using it to build up the body and our calling that God has given to us for the good of our brothers and sisters? Here's another question. What would it look like if we labored not to offend each other and also labor to not be offended by each other. What kind of patience and self-denial is necessary for that? How can we practically consider the interest of our brothers and sisters ahead of our own? Okay, The church is called to be the people of God. We are called to be salt. We are called to be light shining in the darkness. That does not mean we're not going to have issues. You see early on, there's issues, right? There's issues. As long as there's sinners together in a place, there's going to be issues. Right? So there's issues. There, there, there were issues back then. There's going to be issues today. The question is, how will we respond? Will we deny ourselves, pick up our cross, follow Jesus, seek to be a blessing to our brothers and sisters in Christ, seek to bring glory to God? How will we respond to those issues? Let's pray. Father God, we rejoice in your faithfulness we rejoice in your care and the examples you've given us from the early church lord and handling these disputes and these problems lord we pray that you would grant us a similar wisdom that we would prioritize lord how you've wired us to serve and what you've called us to do and and carry that out for the good of our brothers and sisters and for the glory of your name and and lord that you would Help us to follow the example of seeking unity and, and also, Lord, the love of, our, of our, our family here. And so, Lord God, we rejoice that you've given us a Savior who has redeemed us. And you, we pray that, Lord, you would give us the fire, give us the power, give us the energy to deny our cross or deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow after Christ every day. We pray for your glory and in Jesus' name.